All right, that uh, just about does it. Let's get started. So I'd like to welcome everybody this evening to our talk. My name is Nick Tester and I'm the president of the Cambridge Society for Economic Pluralism. CSEP aims to examine pressing economic issues like poverty, inequality and sustainability by drawing from a range of disciplines that bridge humanities and the social sciences, as well as alternative schools of economic thought. Often that involves a good deal of introspection as to what economics is and to what economics should be, which is exactly what we'll be getting here this evening. For some brief admin things, for notification of our future events, please hit, click on the link to our mailing list, which I've posted in the Zoom chat. Over the next two weeks, we'll be hosting Lord Professor Robert Skidelsky to talk on his book, What's Wrong with Economics? A Primer for the Perplexed, as well as Daniela Gabor and Benjamin Braun to discuss central banking and private finance, infrastructural power and climate reform. Now that that's out of the way, I'd like to hand off to Alex to introduce our speaker and lead tonight's discuss discussion, which is on what's worth knowing, economists opinion of economics. Alex, please take it away. Hi everyone, thanks Nick. Uh, I'm Alex, I'm the Vice President of CSEP and today we'll talk about economic research. So I know that economic research is not the sexiest topic in the world, but the truth is that it's very important because like many policies, many political decisions, many events are driven by economic research. So it has ties everywhere in society and it has a huge impact on our daily life, even if we don't really see it. So the question for today is what do economists think about the current state of economic research and what should it look like? And the best way to answer that is well, to ask economists directly and that's exactly what Peter André and Armin Folk from the University of Bonn in Germany did with their survey of 10,000 economic researchers to get their view on economics. So today we are very happy to host Peter André from Bonn University in our talk. And he's between the PhD and postdoc, quite right in the middle of that, at the Brick Institute for Behavior and Inequality, and is the one who ran this very interesting subject. So if you have any question, please keep them for the Q&A at the end. And please, Peter, the floor is yours. All right, thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for the introduction and um, thanks a lot for having me. I recall that um, during my undergrad in Bonn, we also had a similar group. Um, we tried to discuss how economics can be, become more pluralist, et cetera, but the group was way smaller less well organized and we didn't have such a great lecture series so it's it's great uh, that you have it and it's great um, to be part of it today so the topic of my talk is what's worth knowing and i disagree this is a very sexy topic i would say <laughs> because it's so important in let me just okay so science and research matter I think this is a pretty uncontroversial statement for the audience today. And because of that, it really matters what we do research on as a society and as a research discipline. I would even say that the choice of research topics, the choice of the problems we want to solve is among the most important decisions that individual researchers make. And it reflects both their academic freedom, but also academic responsibility. The problem, however, is that it's very hard to say what is interesting and worth knowing, what's worth studying, worth exploring. There's no scientific procedure to answer that question. There are no objective criteria that would tell us what a good research question is. But in the end, you know, it, we don't only want to come up with good answers, we also need to ask good questions. And in practice, um, that's also my experience, um, was my experience during the PhD. This often brings us into an, an awkward situation because we have to retreat to, to gut feeling, to intuition, and to personal value judgments. What are the kind of problems that we consider as important? That's a, that's a normative question. And we thought, given that this is such an important question, given that there is no clear answer to it, why don't we 
survey our colleagues and the experts on this particular question, academic economic researchers, how they evaluate economics in, in, in these respects. And that's the goal of the talk today. I mean, not all of you do economic research yet, I want to say, but even for those who won't, I think this is an interesting question because it uh, sheds light on how research works, on how science works, and thus on a very important part, important part of society. Okay, so what, what do we do? We want to understand how economists think about economics, and we will zoom in. I mean, this is a big question, so we have to zoom in, and we will zoom in on two particular sub-questions. One is what we call research objectives, um, things like policy relevance, uh, basic research, the importance of causal identification in research, uh, multidisciplinarity. We want to understand whether ec ec economists think that the field is currently um, so, um, yeah, aiming for the right objectives, so to say. We also want to zoom in on research topics. So um, the topics that economists explore in their work. Here we focus on, uh, on the broad fields in economics, fields like public, environment, labor, um, economics. And what, what are the topics on which economists should do research and which are the most important topics um, these days? Um, we want to know economists' opinion on these issues. And <clears throat> once we have these views, I think there are a couple of very interesting follow-up questions that we will explore together today. Do economists agree on what is worth knowing or are their preferences very heterogeneous? Do their views differ from the current states of economics? So are they dissatisfied with the status quo or are they happy with how economic research is done today? Um, these are examples for the questions that we are going to explore today. Of course, this project starts from and connects to uh, rich and interesting literature. One thing that I always enjoy about economics is that e economists love doing research about themselves and about their own field. And th th it's a very rich and fascinating literature. And we connect to various themes there. But right now, also in the interest of time, I want to um, directly delve into the details of, of the study and, and what we actually did. So let me start with the sample. The goal, of course, was to understand what the broad profession is thinking, which requires two things. First, we need a large sample to make statistically meaningful, um, um, yeah, to, to, to have statistically meaningful conclusions. Second, the sample should reflect the broad diversity of economists that, that is out there. I mean, um, there are different fields, different ranks, different continents. Um, um, people, some, people's do, some people do research for a couple of years only, others are there since uh, 20, 30 years, and we, want, and we want to represent all of them. And that was the goal, um, an ambitious goal, admittedly. You can judge whether or not we reached it, but I want to explain you how we try to reach it now. So <clears throat> the approach. The idea is to basically create a census of all active academ academic economists um, at the moment. And we uh, went to uh, publication databases, EconLit and Scopus, and we downloaded data on all articles that have been published since 2009 um, in the top 400 economics journals. And when I say top 400, it, that's not really top anymore. That, that's really a, a very broad spectrum of, of journals that is out there. In total, there are about 180,000 articles. And from these articles, we identify authors. And then we zoom in on authors that um, seem to be still active, that do mostly econ research, and for whom we can also find contact data. So that's the approach. And then that's the universe of economists out there, the population of interest. And then we just going, we, we just invite all of them to the survey because then we have a large sample and then we can actually check who is participating and whether um, uh, the, uh, the researchers that select into the survey actually reflect um, the full population of researchers out there. So just to give you a few more details, 
Uh, but I think I already gave you all, all the information. So I said top 400 econ lit journals um, starting in January 2009. Um, we, from these journals, we also have data on what researchers publish on which topics, and, um, and I'm going to use that later. And um, once we identified these authors, we restrict, uh, we restrict attention on those authors that published since 2015, so in the last five years, that published mostly in economics and that are associated with a research institution because we want to focus here on academic economies. And of course, we also need to find a valid email address online. We, we did this manually. Um, um, and because that was a practical requirement for um, um, launching this survey. You can also view it as um, uh, a sign of being an active researcher, so to say, um, that your email address uh, can be found online. So 54,000 authors, um, that's our census, so to say, the full population of economic researchers, and we invited all of them to the survey. This was done in 2020, so the summer of last year. Um, um, we also, you know, we needed a couple of reminders to uh, motivate people to uh, participate in the large numbers we wanted to. And in total, then 8,000, almost 8,000 researchers completed the survey. In addition to that, we also surveyed um, graduate students, PhD students from all around the world. Um, and there we have almost 2000 additional uh, responses, but I'm going to focus on the researchers now because only for the researchers we can quantitatively say whether or not they, they speak for the full profession. I, I don't know what a representative sample of PhD students look like. I don't have data on that. I think we don't have data on that as a profession, but I can but, but I can't make such a statement for the 8,000 researchers and that's why we focus on them mostly. But the results don't differ. They are very similar for, PhD students have very similar views than, than um, so to say, adult um, economic researchers. Of course, we will detect some imbalances. So for instance, we uh, more people from Europe, more researchers from Europe participated in the survey, which I think also reflects um, um, the times at which we sent out the email invitations, but we uh, use survey weights. So we, um, we uh, derive post stratification weights to correct for these imbalances. And I want to show you, so um, let, let me skip, um, let me skip these figures. Uh, tables, I want to show you this figure. This figure shows you uh, for 10 different variables uh, on which we have data. Um, the distribution of this variable, these are density plots, in the full population, that's the red line, the full population of economic researchers, the, the 54,000 researchers, and our weighted sample. And what the figure shows basically is that the sample and the population are very similar in terms of observable characteristics. And we observe many characteristics. We observe things like um, year of first publication, which proxies the age of a researchers, number of articles, um, the share of economic articles, um, even things like how central you are in the global network of co-authorship um, age index, in all of these dimensions, we find that our sample reflects the broad, broad diversity of economic researchers. And that's what, that, that is what makes me confident that the results really speak for the profession. And that's basically um, the point I wanted to make. Okay. <clears throat> so using this sample, we ran the following survey. The survey consists of two um, parts um, and the respondents were randomly assigned to one of these two parts. One part was about the research objectives. Um, um, what, how, how should economists do research? Which objectives should they pursue? And the other survey here on the right side was about topics, on which topics should economists conduct research? And we also collect the data on, on satisfaction, but I probably won't have the time to um, um, deal with this today. Okay, <clears throat> so let's zoom in um, on, on the research objectives. 
here we, I will directly start with one example because um, these questions um, are, e are, 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 are the easiest way to explain them is just to show them. Here's one example. So respondents are told to judge uh, whether um, the current state of research in economics is about right or whether they think economics should put more weight on one objective versus another. We always constructed trade-offs between two different objectives because the research production function, to use the economic terminology, um, uh, always requires to make, often requires to make trade-offs between two different goals. There are, there are no free lunches. Um, you cannot have all the nice things at the same time. Sometimes going for more policy relevance means, for instance, that's the trade-off we consider here, a more policy relevant research question um, could be a question that is less intellectually interesting for the researcher. Um, so um, Duflo, for instance, uh, she, um, her Nobel Prize speech was about uh, the economist as a plumber. And plumbing is not intellectually exciting most of the times, but it's important. We need, there are many, many, uh, many, um, many of these questions that for which an answer is super important, like do, do mosquito nets uh, uh, help? What, what are the effects? Um, these questions are important, but maybe for some research, they are less intellectually interesting because they're not about broad philosophical themes, et cetera. So this is often a trade-off in economic research. And the question is whether economics currently solves it in the right way, whether we are at the optimum between these two different goals or whether economics should move in either of both directions. That's the question that we ask. Here's poly policy relevance versus in, uh, intrinsic intellectual interest. And as you can see, respondents could um, indicate whether they think uh, we need more policy relevance or more into um, intrinsic intellectual interest. Um, there are always three response option, um, much more moderately more and slightly more. And then there's the middle category. Current state is about right. Let me stress about this um, um, because, um, yeah, um, things are never super, are never at, no, it's hard to be exactly at the optimum, but this is just uh, of being uh, of being uh, um, um, yeah about about right, which is which allows for some uh, flexibility. Okay, so here are all the trade-offs that we used in the survey, um, and um, no need to go through this right now because I will um, present them to you step by step together with the results. So there are four different blocks. One is on the importance of policy relevance. One is on the scope and breadth and, and multidisciplinarity of economics. And one is on, on, on um, pr productive tradition versus risky innovation. So that kind of connects to the idea of Kuhn that research either um, develops incrementally within an existing traditional paradigm, or there are periods of disruption in which new paradigms are proposed, challenged, and, and, and um, yeah, the question, um, so that we have three um, um, trade-offs in, in this domain, and then there's a fourth block on the goal of economic theory. All right, and I will present the results um, um, in, in, in this figure. So it's basically only one figure and I will um, um, step by step show you uh, question for question now. So in this figure, you see um, uh, the trade-off that we consider. So in the first trade-off is intrinsic interest versus policy relevance. And you see in, in different colors, what um, fraction of uh, respondents, what fraction of economists endorse um, the different response options. So policy relevance versus intrinsic interest. Do we need more policy relevance in economic research or should uh, is the current state about right or should uh, we focus more on, on the intrinsic interest of, of individual researchers? Here's what the field um, says. So you see, I think there are a couple of things worth stressing. First, there's a lot of heterogeneity. There are um, more than 20% of economists, it's 24% uh, and think that intrinsic interest is the direction to go. And um, something like 40, uh, 54, I think, percent say that we need more policy relevance. So there are 
considerable fraction of economists that endorse different views here, um, which already shows that um, there is no agreement among economists on where things should go. Um, these things are highly controversial. Only 22% of economists are, however, satisfied with the status quo. And there is a majority view, and the majority view is that economics should become more policy relevant. The next trade-off is between basic research, uh, so research that has no immediate uh, implications for uh, policy and societal problems, uh, but of course, eventually it might have such implications, but we don't know yet. Uh, and policy relevance, again, research that has immediate um, consequences for designing better policies, et cetera. And here again, we uh, observe a similar pattern. And again, there is a majority of economists, this time it's like 51%, uh, who would favor a shift towards uh, more policy relevance in economic research. Um, I do mostly empirical work. I shouldn't, shouldn't have said mostly. I, 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 it's basically all empirics that I do. And in, in, in empirical economic research, particularly among microeconomists, there's one a trade-off that um, that 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 is that you yeah that often puts constraints on you. Causal identification. So um, the capacity to answer a causal question, does X lead to more Y in a credible way? That's a goal on, on one side, and it's highly val valued in economics. Um, see, for instance, the recent Nobel Prizes versus the importance of the research question. Often, there are very important questions that are super hard to answer um, causally, to, to, to provide a credible causal answer to. And then the question is whether we should focus, prioritize causal identification and focus on less important research questions instead, or whether we should work on the most important questions. And if that means, if that implies uh, we cannot provide credible causal answers, then we still work on it because the questions are so important and we want to do, um, we want to collect the best data that, that we can. So that's a trade-off that is often binding and relevant in at least in, in my work. And um, um, Akerlof also has a recent paper in the Journal of Economic Literature where he argues that eco economists put too much weight on, on hard methods like uh, math and theory and causal identification with, uh, with advanced statistical techniques, but put too much, uh, too, too little value on, on soft things like the importance of research questions that are also harder to evaluate. So here the question is, does the profession agree with uh, Ekelov in this respect? Um, let's see. Yes, indeed. Again, I mean, let, there is heterogeneity and there are people that uh, would want to see even more causal identification in the field, but the majority would favor a shift towards um, a more emphasis on the importance of research questions in economics. Okay. Um, a last trade-off with which I'm less familiar is the trade-off between pure theory that uh, uh, tries to, um, yeah, in, in very abstract uh, models, tries to, to um, um, using, using advanced mathematical tools, tries to um, um, derive very abstract generalized results, or applied theory that tries to organize empirical data, that tries to um, derive hypothesis for empirical data and that really works closely um, to the application of economics and practice. And here we also see um, that most economists would prefer a shift to more applied theory um, in, 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 in theoretical economics. Okay, that was the first block. The second block, and I will um, speed up um, a little bit. The second block is about the scope and breadth of economic research. First question is whether we want to have very specialized 
researchers um, that know very well how to answer one specific um, you know, question how to solve one specific problem uh, or whether we want to have less special specialization more uh, generalized experts in the field and here um, there is also a tendency towards uh, this is uh, towards less specialization here similar for multidisciplinarity um, here so this is not interdisciplinarity interdisciplinarity is i mean the distinction i mean the semantics i don't i don't care about the semantics here but we uh, we defined multidisciplinary um, as using insights and um, tools from other disciplines to answer economic questions so this is not about asking non-economic questions with economic tools uh, which of course economists also love to do. Um, this is about um, importing insights from other disciplines to, to, to solve our own problems, to solve the questions that we have traditionally been studying. And here, many, many economists want to see more multidisciplinarity. And um, I was personally surprised by that finding because my um, intuition was always that it's, uh, it becomes an uphill battle if you use tools from other disciplines, insights from other disciplines. You always need to justify why this is still uh, how we do it in economics. Um, um, so I was both happy but also surprised to see um, um, a large majority of, that a large majority of economists uh, would endorse uh, more multidisciplinary in their field. Okay. <clears throat> Do we want more incremental, safe research that um, starts from a very traditional paradigm and then um, adds a couple of twists and, um, um, and adds very slowly but steadily to the progress in economic research? Or do we currently need more risky, um, more disruptive research in economics? And here are the views of, of, eco of economists. So first of all, economists would prefer more risky research on the level of the discipline. And they also would prefer more disruptive research. We also ask whether they think um, research should uh, put more emphasis on quantity, so whether there should be more um, different research projects out there or rather focus quality and uh, here economists by and large think that um, a shift towards quality is needed. Um, yeah. Then our final question, um, the goal of economic theory. There's a very traditional discussion in the philosophy of economics starting maybe uh, with um, a seminal paper by Friedman uh, where he argues that economic theory doesn't need to provide a realistic um, description of reality as long as economic theory makes good predictions, that's fine. Theor the test of theory is whether or not it predicts well. And then he argued that um, the classic economics model based on homo economicus, etc., cetera, um, um, is a good as if model, because it often provides good predictions and hence it makes sense to assume that people behave as if they were um, a homo economicus, even if they are not. Um, so that's one view on the goal of economic theory um, that we need to predict. Another view is that um, economic theory should also aim to explain um, empirical phenomena. Um, you could also argue that explanation is the more reliable uh, path to prediction, but that's a different discussion. Here we ask whether um, currently economics should put more weight on prediction versus explanation. And yeah, here the results are, I mean, there is a tendency towards uh, more focus on, on explanation, but results are mixed. And this is also um, the, um, the question for which um, the largest fraction of economists say, Currently, it's about right. 30% endorse this view. Okay, so I want to summarize. There's a large heterogeneity of views and that's important to stress because it really shows that 
Okay, that does not sound like a question. Um, okay, perfect. I will continue. Uh, so there's a large heterogeneity of views. I think that's important to stress because it also showcases how subjective answers to the question of what's worth knowing and what's worth exploring and what should we aim for in economics, how subjective answers to, to this, these questions are. Still, we find a very large dissatisfaction with the status quo across uh, the 10 questions. There were only you know, 13 to and then 31, that's, that's an exception, but um, there was only a small fraction of economists that actually said the current state is about right. And there was always, a, um, with one exception, there was, an ex um, there was a majority of economists agreeing on the direction of change, which would be more policy relevance, more multidisciplinarity, and more disruptive research. Okay, I will I will skip um, um, the discussion of robustness, and I want to I want to continue with the research topics. So we now asked economists um, with which objectives they should do research. Another question is on which topics they should work on, and that's um, the second part of the survey. We asked economists um, yeah, which topics economists should work on. And we did this in the following way. So as you might have heard, in economics, there's the JEL, um, the Journal of Economic Literature Classification Scheme. Um, um, here's an extract. So A, for instance, um, is the field general economics and teaching. It also includes sociology of economics. B is history of economic thought, also heterodox economics. D is micro, E is macro, G is finance, Q I think is environmental, et cetera. So there's, there's a code for every topic in economics. And these are just the, this is just the top level of codes. Um, you can zoom in into D9, for instance, is behavioral economics. And then D91 is, um, um, I, I, I don't even know right now, is, 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 is a, is a sub-theme of behavioral uh, microeconomics. So, and every, every research paper that is published in economics is classified into these different um, topics. And that's great. It's great for our purposes. Um, and it's not, um, it's, not, um, it's not standard to have such a broad classification scheme in, in a research discipline. And we're going to, we, 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 we will exploit this because it's a comprehensive classification scheme. Economists know it. And, and we actually have data on, 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 on the topics uh, that, uh, that have been worked on. So that's the perfect way to capture research topics in, in, in this survey. So we conf we, uh, every respondent faces these 19 primary gel topics. Uh, here you see the first uh, seven of them. And we gave them 100 points. These 100 points reflect um, all published research articles by economists in a given year. And we ask um, economists to assign the points to the topics they think econ economists should be working on. So if they assign, say, 10 points to micro, uh, this means that um, they think that 10% of the research output in economics should be about microeconomics. And that's a way to um, a very detailed way to measure their preferences about the aggregate research output of the profession. Okay, and now we can compare this. I think that's already the next slide. Yes, we can compare the average um, distribution that economists would prefer with the actual distribution of research topics in economic journals. And this is what I do on the next slide. So here, uh, I compare uh, in blue, this is the actual uh, JL topic distribution in the top 400 journals. Um, and I compare this to, uh, based on the 180,000 articles that we, uh, that we compiled uh, for which we have data. Um, and I compare it to the average response in the survey. And there are two things, at least two things worth stressing here. So first of all, if you would just rank the topics according to their importance in the real uh, world and um, in, in, in the survey and according to the preferences of economists, you would receive very similar rankings. 
And the rank order, the sperm and rank order correlation is also very high. So qualitatively, just in terms of ranking, um, the topics that economists currently work on are close to the preferences, uh, the average preferences of the profession. But quantitatively, of course, you see huge differences. And there is a pattern here. Consider, for instance, D microeconomics um, and G finance. These are two fields, and maybe also L, which is industrial organization. These are the three fields, uh, the three most prominent fields in, in, in the actual publication data. And there, economists would prefer to see less research on average. If you consider fields that are less prominent, that are peripheral at the moment, like um, general economics, uh, history of economic thought, um, economic history, um, K, I think, is law and economics. Um, um, there you see that there's less research out there than economists would prefer. And the conclusion that we draw from this is that there is a preference for more diversity in the research topics of, of economics. Resources should be um, uh, with should should be taken from the most prominent fields and devoted to less prominent fields in order to diversify the overall topic distribution in economics. That's at least the result if we compare uh, what's what's out there with the average survey response um, um, in our survey. As you might know, in economics, I mean, journals, um, top 400 journals um, underlie, uh, underlie the blue bus here, and not all journals are created equal. And in economics, it actually matters a lot uh, where you publish, and there are five um, journals that have a particularly um, good reputation, and um, publishing there is um, something that um, many economists aim for. And these top these journals also yeah, try to present the best of economics research in all fields. So another uh, comparison that we could uh, that we could make here is we compare the average preferences of economists with the distribution in these top five journals. And this is what I do in this graph. So here in dark blue, um, the dark blue is the top are the top four hundred journals and uh, light light blue are the top five journals compared with in red, uh, the survey responses. And I think, I mean, there's many things are going on in this. Uh, it's a very, uh, this graph is very detailed in information, but two things are important. Um, maybe only one thing. Basically we find the same pattern here. It's a similar rank order correlation, but again, we have, um, 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 uh, desire for more diversity. So fields like um, D micro, uh, which is very prominent in the top fives, um, receive much uh, much lower weight in our survey. Um, and fields that are less prominent in the top fives, uh, economic history, um, law and economics, etc., cetera, um, general economics, they, they receive a larger weight in our survey. So very similar pattern here. One thing that I personally want to stress here is that Q, Q, which is environmental economics um, and agricultural economics, but also environmental economics. Uh, if you would ask me, and then no, this is a subjective, a personal view, I would say it's one of the most important policy problems we will be facing uh, in the next decades that we are facing today. And there's very little research in environmental economics, agricultural economics that is published in the best journals of the discipline, which, um, also, if compared to the average preferences of economists, um, um, is not is not ideal. Okay, um, I'm going to skip that. The figure basically says that there are many different ways to to derive these figures, and how we do so doesn't matter. We get the same results. I want to get to this final question, which I think is really. Um, that's the question that was on top of our minds when we, when we saw the data. How come that economists do not produce the research they collectively prefer? It's a little bit puzzling because econ economists are the producers of economic research. They have, have autonomy. They are also the judges and evaluators of, of research. So 
Why don't they do what they want to do? And this is ongoing. This is ongoing work. So we um, we plan to um, do more work on this um, in the future. But I can already share um, what we have so far. So one story, one hypothesis that we came up with is that maybe it's just the broad field that is dissatisfied, but the most influential economists are actually very happy with how things are currently uh, done. Um, may science is not a democracy. In science, some people have a higher say, have more influence uh, because they have shown that they, um, because they have produced the more influential research in the past. And you could even argue that they have better taste and know better what is good for economics. So are these scholars actually more satisfied? And um, is it maybe good that economics is not doing what the average economist would prefer? The answer I think to that question is no, because top economists largely share the same views, have the same opinion as, um, as the average economists. So here we focus on three indicators of being influential in economics. First, having published an article in the, top, in the um, five best journals, being an editor, so someone who decides uh, which papers are published or not at uh, the top 50 journals, and being a referee, um, these are the guys that uh, write reports. So that's that's the peer review system, basically. These are the men and women uh, who um, who write reports and say and and, re and write recommendation that's to an editor about whether or not to publish a paper. So in our um, data of eight thousand economists, we identified um, scholars who published uh, in top five um, who. Uh, are editors at uh, top 50 journals or who refereed for top fives in the past. And what you see here visually is that um, these economists have very similar views as the uh, full sample. So um, cannot be that influential, influential econ economists are also not dissatisfied. So the story I propose doesn't work, doesn't explain um, um, the, the mismatch that we document. The next uh, hypothesis that we explored is whether um, this is all due to time next. I mean, research is incredibly slow. Um, that's something I am still struggling with uh, and realized in the, uh, in the last years. It just takes a lot of time and it's a lot of work. And maybe um, we are just dissatisfied with the status quo because the research we love um, will be published only in five years. And in five years, um, um, the actual distribution of research topic uh, would have uh, caught up with, um, with our preferences. Um, but that's also not the case. Um, this is just um, an, an extract now from one piece of, uh, one, of one analysis that we ran, um, which shows um, the uh, share of publications in different fields. So these are the jail fields. Again, D is micro, G is finance, E is macro, F is international economics. And as you see, there was very little movement in the last uh, decade, in particular, the mismatch between um, there's no trend for microeconomics, no trend for um, finance, also no trend for things like general economics, history of economic thought. I highly doubt that trends alone and time lags will solve the problem. So we also um, answer this question with no, this cannot explain um, the mismatch. So the last hypothesis that we want to explore, and as I said, that is ongoing work, um, are career concerns and publication incentives. Because, I mean, there are many motives to do research. One motive is uh, because you care about a problem, you are just fascinated by it, you enjoy doing so, you think it's important for society, uh, you can be intrinsically motivated to do research. But uh, in practice, um, this alone is hard to sustain. Um, you are, as researchers, you are also part of an incentive system and the incentives are to publish, to publish well, um, to be cited, to uh, have a good reputation among your colleagues. And of course, many researchers, I mean, 
the idea, I mean, that, that was our hypothesis. We thought that these motives also matter in economic research. And then there, there are publication centers. Some things are easier to publish than others. Maybe currently um, um, cause identification is on Vogue, is very fashionable, and um, it's very hard to publish a paper on a very important question uh, without proper empirical causal identification. So maybe people just don't do it, even though they think it should be done. They don't do it because their incentives are, um, are misaligned. Multidisciplinarity is another example. So um, I, I already told you that I would have thought um, multidisciplinarity is, is uh, less wanted. And I would have thought that the returns to multidisciplinary research are, are low in economics, that it's an uphill battle to do uh, multidisciplinary research. And then um, in, um, researchers that are motivated to publish, they, well, that want to get a job in, in, in academia, they might not um, uh, run these projects. So, so that's, that's um, our third hypothesis. And I cannot give you a conclusive answer yet, but um, maybe, maybe that's part of the reason. <clears throat> One thing that we did in our surveys, we asked researchers what motivates them to work on the topics they work on. And they could choose among uh, different motives how important these motives are. And here are four extrinsic motives, namely um, writing, um, uh, yeah, working on a topic that yields a publication in a high level journal, um, increasing number of citations, increasing one's reputation, and um, to yeah, career concerns. So writing on topics that help you find a job in academia. And many economists, that's basically the takeaway from that figure, many economists um, say that these motives matter for them when they choose their research topics. And so um, uh, one thing that's very important to stress, it's not, I, it's, I think it's not per se bad if uh, researchers are motivated also Extrinsically, we also ask them about intrinsic motives, and, and, and many of them are highly intrinsically motivated. But extrinsic motives matter too. And that's not necessarily a problem because extrinsic motives can, can push us, can encourage us to do great work. But they can also lead to um, to they can also lead to such a mismatch potentially between um, between uh, what between what people do and what they actually think should be done if um, publication incentives are misaligned with um, the private views of economists. And one way to think about our project and the results of this project is that they reveal what economists have been, uh, what, what their views are, because that was very hard to, 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 to say beforehand. And so maybe um, our project also Mm, provides this, this, yeah, kind of corrects um, the views. I mean, I now know that apparently many, many economists um, 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 think highly of multidisciplinary research and want to see more of it. That's definitely encouraging for me. And maybe the results have um, similar effects for other researchers as well. Okay, my time is almost up. So uh, let me conclude. Um, the views of economists are very heterogeneous and we found and discovered a prevalent dissatisfaction with the status quo. Economists want more policy relevance, more multidisciplinarity, more risky and disruptive research and also a diverse uh, set of research topics. I think uh, it is important um, to uh, be aware of the fact that any answer to the question of what's worth knowing is subjective and based on personal value judgments and that economists do not agree um, on, on this. Agreement is unlikely. I think we don't even want agreement on that because this plurality, the diversity of views that's very uh, enriching, um, that, that's um, very fascinating, that's very stimulating and, and it, it's, it's a good sign I would say. But it's also important to realize that every individual view is, in, is, is, is invaluable, irreplaceable, yes, but also subjective. So, um, um, uh, yeah, it may well be that you will start uh, working on a project that you think is uh, worth knowing, worth studying, worth exploring. And um, a couple of people have a different view. Um, 
don't be discouraged by that. That's Okay, finally, we discovered this mismatch between preferences and reality. Um, it seems that the field currently is not appreciating and doing what we collectively prefer. I do think uh, this has implications for diversity in economics, but that's something that I didn't cover today. Um, and it definitely calls for an open and transparent discussion about what we think is worth knowing in economics. And we hope that this paper kind of stimulates and informs such a debate. One last point I want to make. And there's one very that you might have that economists generally disagree about everything. And so of course they also disagree about what's worth knowing. Um, here's one last uh, fun fact. We also asked the uh, respondents whether they think that uh, our project, the question of what's worth knowing and how economists think about it is worth studying. And here 90% almost agreed. Um, so uh, that's a good sign. Economists can actually agree. And they agree that the question of what's worth knowing is worth answering. So thanks so much for your attention. And I'm um, looking forward to the discussion. Um, that's going to be fun. Thanks.